Tonight at 11, we were there as community members and fellow officers remembered the sacrifice of fallen Lieutenant John Stewart. Plus, News 13 learned not all South Carolina Highway Patrol troopers have body cameras. We asked why. That answer is next. Coverage you can count on at 11 starts now. And thanks for joining us tonight at 11. I'm Annette Pegler. Bob has the evening off. First at 11, we've been following the deadly officer involved shooting from September 11th in Horry County and learned that trooper WB Benton was not wearing a body camera. A 2015 law states that all law enforcement are required to wear them. So why don't all South Carolina Highway Patrol troopers have them? News 13's Maria DeBone tells us why. This video from the 15th Circuit Solicitor's Office shows Trooper W.B. Benton and Tristan Vereen in an altercation that resulted in Vereen being shot in the chest and later dying. The video also shows Benton tasing Vereen and then Vereen using Benton's taser on him and biting him. We would have been in a real mess if um, where the cars stopped, if that were to have been in a place without a camera or with a uh, place with very little camera because we would not have been able to uh, look at all of this. Richardson said Benton's car did have a camera, but he didn't have a body camera. And he said not all South Carolina Highway Patrol troopers who drive on these highways every day have them. I've seen where the South Carolina Highway Patrol has asked uh, for funding for cameras many times and they have been denied. South Carolina Highway Patrol Captain Kelly Hughes said the body worn camera program fund went into effect in 2016 and every year since then they've been given money to outfit some of their troopers with them, but they're not required to implement all troopers with them until the agency has received the full funding and only 15 out of 52 troopers in Horry County have body cameras. But I think that this will push um, our legislators more to help fund the cameras. Captain Hughes said they've issued 100 body cameras this year and 104 are in the process of being issued as new patrol cars with cameras are being assigned to the field weekly. Reporting for News 13, I'm Maria DeBone. Today we received a picture of what civil rights attorney Harry Daniels says is Vereen's windshield days after that shooting incident. Vereen's family says he was pulled over for a cracked windshield. The family says there was a small crack, but 15th Circuit solicitor Jimmy Richardson previously said the windshield was, quote, basically holding on by a thread. It was cracked all the way across. We're working to learn whether Vereen's car is still in law enforcement custody. Well, new at 11, Florence police need your help to find this missing man. Brandon Cameron is 36 years old and has autism and a history of seizures. He was last seen leaving a waiting room at McLeod Hospital last night around 11. He's five foot six and 160 pounds. He was last seen wearing Western style clothing and a cowboy hat. If you know where he is, call police. Well, tonight there is still no word on how college student Sheridan Wall died in Florence County, but we are learning more about the moments. The body of the 21 year old from Tampa, Florida was discovered. She was reported missing Sunday in Myrtle Beach. Take a look at this new video we got of the cornfield where Wall's car was found on Sunday. Investigators with the Florence County Sheriff's Office says or say her Toyota Corolla was found burned in a ditch in this area off Keith Lane in Scranton. Now her body was found about 10 miles away from that field. She was found Tuesday behind the Hannah Salem friend field fire station. That's on US 378 near Pamplico. And the report released this afternoon, deputies noted that it looked like Wall had been there quote a while. We asked, we have asked for more details in this case. We will update you on air and online. Moving to the Gabby Petito case today, we learned she had ties to the Carolinas. Petito lived in Carolina Beach, North Carolina, worked in Wilmington, and even though she didn't end up going, she applied to Cape Fear Community College. The manager of the Wilmington restaurant Smoke on the Water says Petito worked there from September 2017 to January 2019. She worked as a hostess before moving to Florida. She's not just a name. She's not just a case. Um, she was a person and she was very special to a lot of people and many of us here. The restaurant has set up a table in remembrance of their former co-worker and friend. The restaurant plans to plant a tree in her memory sometime in the near future.
And new since six, the FBI has issued an arrest warrant for Brian Laundrie, Petito's fiance. A grand jury indicted Laundrie for his activities following her death. The FBI says Laundrie will be charged with intent to defraud for one or more unauthorized uses of a Capital One bank card between August 30th and September 1st. The FBI says it's still investigating Petito's death, and at last check, Laundrie is still on the loose. Well, tonight, people gathered in Lake City for a prayer vigil in honor of fallen Lake City police officer, Lieutenant John Stewart. News 13's Jack Billy was there and heard from his family and city officials. People came to Dr. Ronald McNair Memorial Park this evening to share songs and prayers in honor of Lieutenant Stewart, who was killed during a pursuit last Friday. Mayor Loveth Anderson called Stewart a remarkable man. He's coming. And I know my last conversation with him. I said, I need you to do something. And he said, uh, okay. And I said, are you working? He said, no. I said, well, let's get somebody else to do it. But he came in and did it himself. Lake City Police Chief Joseph Cooper also shared memories of Stewart's time with the department. He says he's been touched by the show of support from people who knew him, even some of those he arrested. They came to the police department and said, Jody, is that, is that true? Is that true on Facebook? Is John dead? I said, yeah, John has been taken from us. You know, the guy shook his head. He said, man, I, I'm going to miss it. And I was like, wait a minute, now he put you in jail about six times, boy. I mean. Lieutenant Stewart's sister recalled how seriously he took the job. He was a good guy. You'll never know the man he would have been. But please do believe and keep the man that you knew that was not in act. He would arrest any of us. I need you to survive. Jack Billiou, News 13. Thanks, Jack. And Lieutenant Stewart's funeral will be held tomorrow at 11 at the Florence Center. After that, the procession to the Florence National Cemetery will take place at 1 p.m. Lieutenant Stewart was a Marine veteran. He was also 48 years old. Governor Henry McMaster has ordered all flags to be flown at half staff tomorrow in tribute to Lieutenant Stewart. You can read a lot more on this case, including about the suspect online at WBTW.com. News 13 is tracking shootings across our area, and so far this month, 29 have been reported from the Border Belt, PD, and the Grand Strand. That's more than the past few months, and we still have a week left of September. And so far this month, there have been there have only been six days without a shooting. Law enforcement in our area on average is working more than one shooting a day. Of those two are deadly shootings in Loris. Police say the city typically sees one shooting every two or three years. The majority of shootings in their area are committed by repeat offenders. Officials tell us they need witnesses to solve these crimes. Loris police are using a new tool to encourage that called evidence.com. It's a citizen's portal that we can set up for anything that we need to investigate. Um, and they can send their own pictures, their own videos, a statement, and be completely anonymous. On WBTW.com, we have an interactive map which shows local gun violence hotspots. You can also track shootings that are happening in your neighborhood down to the street. It's all online right now at WBTW.com. Three people were killed in two separate crashes today in Robinson County. The first crash happened around 3.30 a.m. on I-95. An 18-wheeler hit a bridge overpass. The driver, George Hardgrove of Georgia, died. The second crash happened around 10 a.m. on Chase and Road. Two cars were involved in that one. Drivers Don Davis and Irene Locklear, both of Lumberton, died. South Carolina added another 2,200 new COVID cases today and 39 more deaths. DHEC data shows hospital occupancy dropped in some PD counties today. That may be welcomed relief for hospitals. But tonight, Kate Prestak spoke to a doctor at MUSC Charleston who says with flu season almost here, we all need to be safe case rate per day has dropped a lot. Cases of the COVID-19 Delta variant are going down in the Tri-County. In the Charleston County, we're down to 49 cases per day per 100,000. But the real leader is Dorchester County. They still, they've been dropping the rates as well, but they're at 105 cases per day per 100,000. In Berkeley, is at 58 cases per day. Dr. Michael Sweat, the director for MUSC Center for Global Health, says while the case rate is declining, it could be some time before the hospitals feel relief. Right now, at least at the MUSC uh, hospital, we're starting to see some declines, um, but you know, it's sort of flatline now, and I, I do think in a couple of weeks we'll see the declines. But that decline depends on if more continue to get vaccinated against COVID-19 and influenza.
With our hospitals busy taking care of COVID patients, that's really the last thing we need is to have a flu epidemic happen on top of that. Dr. Sweat says last year's largest wave for the pandemic came in the winter. And because there was a weak flu epidemic last year as mask mandates were in place and many kept distanced, immunity against the flu was not built up, creating a concern that this year the epidemic could hit hard. So we really got to watch what's going to happen as we move into the cooler months. Um, and it's just hard to know. We only have so much history with COVID. There's a lot of differences now with vaccination. Uh, so it's something we have to watch. And that was Kate Prestack reporting in Charleston. And later at 11, we look at when booster shots can start going into more arms now that the CDC has okayed them. That's coming up in just a few minutes. Next, our media group News 13's parent company is still working with Feeding America to help families during Hunger Action Month. And locally, Harvest Hope is helping the 700,000 people who struggle with food insecurity in South Carolina. Harvest Hope has gotten creative in how to get food to its neighbors. And officials say the greatest need is in the PD, Marlboro, and Dillon counties. Every person that interacts with us, I want them to be able to leave in a better place that they came. And the fact that we can help a mom feed her family at night, it, it's it's what drives me every day. Harvest Hope mobile food pantries have reached about 200 to 250 families during each distribution. We found people hiding in freezers and in locked offices. Next at 11, an alarming details about the moments a gunman opened fire in a Kroger store this afternoon in Tennessee and what possible motives led to that tragedy. Frank. And the nice weather we saw today. We'll be back again tomorrow. I'll let you